let me begin by introducing our first speaker. Uh, our first speaker is the James Utley Professor of Surgery, Dr. Jerry Doherty. He's also the Surgeon in Chief of Boston Medical Center. Uh, and as many of you know, our Surgical Oncology Fellowship is anchored at BU. Uh, and so in proper rank, Dr. Doherty is my chair. And so it takes me a great pleasure to introduce him to talk this morning about uh, pancreatic neuroendocrine neoplasms. Dr. Doherty. Well, thank you, Joe, and good morning, everybody. Welcome <clears throat> to the New England Oncology Symposium, and congratulations to Steve and the crew for, for getting things off the ground. Uh, I'm going to take the next 25 minutes or so and, and give you an overview of, of how we think about pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors and, and uh, some thoughts about uh, um, the incidental tumors that we're all seeing increasingly. And hopefully this will advance. Let's see. So these are the... the uh, topics that I'm going to cover, the general approach to pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, a little bit about uh, the three most common subtypes, uh, the two functional tumors that are most common, insulinoma and gastrinoma, as well as some about non-functional neuroendocrine tumors of the pancreas. And then finally, um, this very hot topic of incidental tumors of the pancreas that we see uh, increasingly because of the widespread use of imaging. The general principles that we use when managing um, these somewhat rare tumors uh, are listed here. This concept of biochemistry before radiology or surgery is really important. And we've all uh, seen these situations where we get sort of led down the garden path. The patient has some symptoms of hypoglycemia, and there's a question of whether they may have an insulinoma. And so um, somebody gets imaging before confirming the biochemical diagnosis. Uh, and it leads to problems because then they find a little lump in the pancreas, everybody assumes it's an insulinoma, uh, and, and uh, we, we kind of get the cart before the horse. So uh, in, in best practice is to get the biochemistry workup confirmed so we know exactly what we're looking for before we start doing the, the radiology or any, certainly any operations. To the extent that we can, we like to separate the control of the hormonal syndrome from the control of the, any malignant disease we might be dealing with, and I'll give you some examples of where we're successful with that and where we're not successful that, with that uh, in gastronome and insulinoma, respectively. And finally, uh, we want to try and tailor the risk of the operative approach to the severity of the disease. Uh, these are, can be very uh, dramatic operations with significant complications, and so we want to make sure that we uh, uh, balance the risks and benefits appropriately. So in somebody where, where we suspect the possibility of a neuroendocrine pancreas tumor, uh, the first step is to establish the diagnosis biochemi biochemically. Now that varies depending on the syndrome that we suspect, and this presumes that this is a patient in whom we're, we're detecting them based on symptoms rather than based on uh, some imaging finding. Uh, so the tests that we use depend on the syndrome that we suspect. Uh, for example, for insulinoma, the gold standard test is a supervised fast um, with the marker uh, of disease being hypoglycemia with uh, concomitant hyperinsulinism. Uh, there are a lot of details about the fast. We used to call this a 72-hour fast. Uh, it almost never takes 72 hours. About 50% of the people are diagnosed within 18 hours. Uh, so the, the mm -hmm. sort of key issues for the insulinoma fast is that it's supervised in the hospital, the patient takes non-caloric liquids, uh, and we also check for evidence of factitious hypoglycemia um, by evaluating for urine, sulfonylureas, as well as, as um, uh, uh, evidence of insulin precursors in the serum to document that it's not exogenously delivered insulin. Gastronoma uh, can be diagnosed by a, a elevated fasting gastrin with concomitant uh, acid in the stomach. So the most common cause of elevated gastrin in the hospital is pernicious anemia. Um, that probably the second most common cause um, for mildly elevated gastrins is proton pump inhibitors. So anybody who has a lack of acid in their stomach will have a physiologically normally elevated gastrin level. Uh, and this confuses people quite a bit. And so the most common reason we get a call about a patient with a gastrinoma is somebody who doesn't have one at all, uh, but in fact has uh, uh, no acid in their stomach. 
So in order to document a gastrinoma, we have to know both the serum gastrin and the level of acid in the stomach. VIPoma is one of the uh, more rare of these rare tumors. Uh, this is a vasoactive intestinal polypeptide producing tumor, uh, which causes a very severe diarrhea syndrome uh, and an elevated serum VIP in the presence of a secretory diarrhea, uh, which means diarrhea that continues when the patient is fasting. Um, uh, is uh, diagnostic for that syndrome. And then glucagonoma syndrome, another very rare uh, tumor type, um, can be diagnosed based on the elevated glucagon in the presence of these other features. Once we've determined that the patient has a uh, pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor syndrome, a part of the history should very early evaluate whether the patient has familial or sporadic disease, or at least has a risk of, of familial disease. So there should be a family history with, a, with specific attention to evidence for MEN1. Uh, Sally Cardi and her group at the University of Pittsburgh have come up with what they call the Cardi 6. It's the six questions that you ask somebody if you want to decide whether they have MEN1, and this is useful whether the patient has multi-gland parathyroid disease or pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor or or other things. You ask the patient um, if they have any family members who've had a brain tumor, neck surgery, hypercalcemia, pancreas cancer. I've only gotten to four. I've got to remember the last two. Um, pancreas, there's two neck. Oh, the, you ask them if they've had pituitary tumors or, or growth hormone problems. And if they've had any of those things, then you can investigate the family further for multiple endocrine neoplasia type 1. All these patients should have a serum level of, of uh, calcium and prolactin to evaluate for the two other main components of MEN1 in the patient who, who we know has a pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor. The calcium is a reasonable screening uh, um, test for hyperparathyroidism in these patients, especially if they're over 40 years of age. Uh, and prolactin is, it, prolactinoma is the most common of the functional uh, pituitary tumors that these patients get. If you're in doubt or if you have some indication that there might be a cause, the patient has a family member who's had kidney stones, for example, um, then you can investigate suspicious first-degree relatives. And it's very reasonable to involve the adult medical genetics uh, group at this point uh, so that they can help with gathering family members and consents and, and uh, laboratory values, et cetera. The third step in the evaluation and management of a patient with a pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor with a functional syndrome is to treat the symptoms of hormone excess. Um, and some of these syndromes we're pretty effective at treating, and some of them we are very ineffective at treating, and that influences what we do for the rest of the patient's therapy. Insulino insulinoma, for example, we are very ineffective at treating by things other than operation. So uh, we can treat them with diet or diazoxide to, to try and keep their uh, uh, serum glucose from getting too low. If they take multiple small meals a day, they eat complex carbohydrates such as cornstarch-based diets, uh, then we can um, keep their, their glucose levels adequate and avoid the neuroglycopenic symptoms and seizures and so on. It does cause them to, to gain weight. Um, and it's not a particularly effective uh, strategy overall. It can be effective in palliating them until we get to operation, but operation is almost always necessary for treatment of the insulinoma syndrome. Uh, in, and, and I would say that octreotide, although it's on the list here, is rarely very effective. Uh, insulinomas have relatively low numbers of, of type 2 and type 5 somatostatin receptors, and so the octreotide or somatostatin analog is not very effective at treating these patients. Gastronoma is the direct opposite of insulinoma. We can suppress the gastric acid output in everybody with a gastronoma. So no matter how high their gastrin is, no matter how bad their ulcer disease is, no matter how bad the diarrhea that they have because of their high acid output, uh, we can always suppress their, their gas, or suppress their acid output and completely obviate the gastronoma syndrome, Zollinger-Ellison syndrome. Uh, now, that was true when all we had was H2 blockers, uh, although it required very high doses of, of H2 blockers at times that would generate a lot of calls from the pharmacy about why we were giving three grams of ranitidine a day. Um, but now that we have 
um, proton pump inhibitors that are very effective at reasonable doses, uh, it's even easier. So there's, there is never a reason to operate on somebody with a gastronoma just for the syndrome. The reason we operate on people with gastronoma is because of potential malignancy. For VIPoma, uh, the uh, octreotide, somatostatin analog, is incredibly effective at palliating the syndrome. We can completely obviate the syndrome with octreotide, and now that we have the uh, long-acting uh, depot injections of octreotide that we can give once every four weeks, um, these patients do extremely well. We can get rid of all the, the diarrhea and problem. They, they do often still require some potassium supplements, however. And for glucagonoma syndrome patients, uh, the octreotide is very effective at getting rid of the, the rash and the hyperglycemia. Um, however, their hypercoagulability um, remains, and so um, many people consider at least an aspirin a day in these people. Um, there are not great data for an IV, IVC filter, although um, for people with large tumors, we will often p place those prophylactically um, prior to operation uh, with their removable filter. So finally, it's only at the fourth step that we get to the imaging study. And I would say that this is where people sort of break down. They get somebody who comes in, you know, they were brought in by ambulance with a glucose of 30 and they uh, are thought to have an insulinoma and the first thing somebody does is get a CT scan. And then they find a lump in the pancreas and, and you're sort of off to the races with uh, chasing something that's not the actual problem. Um, so if we follow this recipe appropriately, um, we can get the, if we know the biochemical diagnosis, then we can interpret these often very um, subtle abnormalities in the imaging um, more appropriately. The, the best imaging for insulinoma is the one that works for the individual patient. Um, th th we, there's been a lot written, people say there's been more written about insulinoma than there are patients who've had it. Um, the, the, uh, there's a lot written about which is the best imaging. You, we used to talk about arteriography or um, MRI, CT scan, and so on. I, I kind of think we, we keep going until we find the, image, the, the imaging modality that works for that individual patient, because they're often small tumors, median size of less than a centimeter, um, and so they can be a little hard to find. We always start with at least some cross-sectional imaging, because there is a proportion of these insulinoma patients who have metastatic disease, and we want to make certain that we're not dealing with one of those 10% uh, or so of people who present with liver metastases as a part of their malignant insulinoma uh, presentation. Octreotide scan is not very effective for insulinoma patients. Uh, if you can see an insulinoma on an octrea scan, you can see it with almost any of the other imaging modalities. Uh, because of this low number of type 2 and 5 somatostatin receptors, it's just not a very effective imaging agent for that disease, for this disease. Rarely we use a calcium angiogram, and I'm going to show you an example of that in a moment. Gastronoma, in contrast to insulinoma, um, is very effectively imaged by octreotide scan, it, and um, that, that can be a very useful modality. We use that in essentially everybody who has a, a gastronoma. Um, rarely we can use a provocative angiogram with secretin, um, although I would say that is uh, sort of diminishing value over time. Uh, as we uh, have a lot of knowledge of where these occur now. Um, and endoscopic ultrasound is, is rarely useful there as well. For the non-functional tumors and the other more rare tumors, uh, CT scan and octreotide scan seem to be the best imaging modalities. The immediate preoperative preparation is the preparation for a patient who's going to have a major pancreatic resection. Um, certainly give them the vaccines mm -hmm. as there's always some risk of needing to remove the spleen. Uh, if you do a bowel prep before um, the operation for these patients, you have to be careful in the insulinoma um, folks that you don't make them hypoglycemic. Uh, and it's often a call to the insurance company to explain why the patient should be in the hospital on the night before the operation, which we don't typically do for other uh, patients now. Um, uh, and the ZE patients, if, they're, if they have the particularly virulent uh, ulcer disease, uh, it, it, when we do bowel preps in those patients, and I don't routinely do this, but patients who need bowel preps before their operation, if they're going to have a particularly big operation, um, we bring them in and put them on IV acid blockade agents. Octreotide as a perioperative modality to try and decrease the risk of um, pancreatic leak uh, 
um, has uh, conflicting randomized studies uh, as to the utility of, of this. If you try to divide up the studies to figure out which, when, when it works and when it doesn't, it appears that the studies that use octreotide only after the operation, uh, there was no difference uh, between giving octreotide and not giving octreotide in terms of the length of time before drains are removed and the amount of total drainage the patient had. If you start the octreotide before the operation, uh, there are some trials that show that that is of benefit. Um, so I, I think at this point, it's sort of personal practice. I don't think there's a strong evidence base for, for recommending for or against it. And then the antibiotics that we typically use for pancreatic surgery. <clears throat> These are, are big operations, and, and everybody uh, knows the, the, the um, pitfalls of operating on the pancreas, uh, particularly if we're going to leave uh, uh, portions of the pancreas behind, the, the pancreatic leaks and astomotic leaks and so on uh, can have significant uh, patient impact. This is an example of a recent uh, series from the uh, NCI of patients with pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors and looking at their complication rates just to give people an idea of, of how complex these operations are or how complex the recovery from these operations are, uh, even in expert hands. Um, now, these are, this is not a randomized trial of enucleation versus resection. Clearly, the, the surgeons were trying to choose what they believed was the safest operation for that individual patient. And if it's a very distal um, pancreatic tumor, they may choose a distal pancreatectomy. If it's a, a, a tumor in the head of the pancreas, they may for, be forced to do a pancreatic or duodenectomy. Uh, but you can see the complication rate for um, both of those things is significant. Readmission rates of 15 to 20 percent. Uh, patients have a drain in place for an average of about two weeks or a median of two weeks. Um, and about 40 percent of the patients have a drain for more than three weeks. So it's, it's, we, we talk to patients about you know, what the recovery is like if it goes perfectly well, but it often doesn't go perfectly well. We need to make sure that they understand that. We need to make sure that we take that into account as we plan these procedures. Death, fortunately, is very rare um, with these procedures now with, with modern surgical and recovery techniques. So I'm going to talk a little bit more specifically now about uh, some of the, the tumor types. Insulinoma um, is generally a small, benign uh, lesion that are nearly always in the pancreas. Um, the syndrome is typically a bigger problem than malignancy. Um, as I said, these tumors have a median size of less than a centimeter. Um, we're diagnosed by supervised fast. Intraoperative ultrasound can be very helpful. And a, the lowest morbidity possible resection is often an enucleation in these patients if the, the tumor is away from the pancreatic duct. And these can be done either open or by uh, laparoscopic techniques. Um, on the top right, you see a, a figure of a, a paper from the NCI. Uh, showing the distribution of insulinomas throughout the pancreas. These can occur anywhere uh, along the length of the pancreas. Uh, the um, tumors, each of those is an individual patient's tumor, and the ones that are in circles are tumors that could only be identified by intraoperative ultrasound. They couldn't be identified by the surgeon with palpation, uh, sort of emphasizing the small nature of these tumors, and especially when the tumors are buried in the head of the pancreas, uh, the utility of that intraoperative ultrasound. Occasionally, we have tumors that we can't find in the head of the pancreas, or we have patients who have apparent uh, hypoglycemia with hyperinsulinism, uh, and there's a question of whether the patient has a diffuse form of insulin secretion from the pancreas, um, or if they have a focal form with the insulinoma. And so we can use this selective arteriography with stimulation of the pancreas um, by calcium infusion or pentagastrin infusion infusion for uh, gastronoma. Um, but the calcium infusion uh, will stimulate the uh, pancreas cells to produce insulin, and then we can measure the insulin level in the hepatic vein um, over time. And I'll show you what this looks like to tell us, to, to help regionalize where the tumor might be. So here's an example of an insulinoma in the head of the pancreas on arteriogram. And you can see that uh, very clear uh, blush uh, uh, of the tumor site. Uh, so this one is clearly diagnostic, and if you inject um, insulin into the, um, 
artery supplying that tumor, you can see in the yellow line uh, the rapid rise of the hepatic vein insulin level. If this patient didn't have a tumor, but in fact had this diffuse form of insulin production, we would see all the lines look like those ones that run across the bottom, and those patients should not have an operative exploration looking for a focal tumor, um, as they uh, apparently have uh, the uh, more diffuse form. A few words about gastronoma. Uh, gastronoma is uh, sort of the, the opposite of insulinoma in many ways. It's a very uh, much more commonly malignant disease. Probably two-thirds of the patients with gastronoma have malignant disease based on uh, nodal or liver metastasis. Um, it, it can be kind of tenacious, although it, it doesn't kill people quickly. Um, people don't die of gastronoma unless they have liver metastasis. They don't die of, of, uh, of uh, lymph node metastasis. And so um, it's something we have to sort of um, try and cure the disease, but we want to make sure that the, the punishment fits the crime, so, so to speak, in terms of the gravity of the operation. The gastronomas are typically in either the head of the pancreas or in the wall of the duodenum. About 40 to 50 percent of these tumors are in the wall of the duodenum. Um, prior to the recognition of that fact in the late 1980s, uh, we thought that about 40% of them started in lymph nodes because we would find just lymph node metastasis and, and never find the primary. Uh, once we recognized that these were in the duodenum, we started to, to find a lot of them there. And so you can see in the arteriogram on the, the left side of the screen that uh, small tumor in the, the uh, wall of the duodenum, the octreotide scan in the middle, it almost always demonstrates lymph node disease rather than the primary tumor. Um, and then on the, uh, the right side of the screen, you can see this small tumor uh, at the edge of the duodenum. The metastases to regional lymph nodes, as I said, are very frequent. Um, local recurrences can be very large and invasive tumors, as you can see uh, from this patient here with the, I don't see the pointer, but uh, this patient here with a large recurrence in the head of the pancreas on the CT scan, as well as lymph node, or I'm sorry, liver metastasis, you can see in the right lobe at the, in the bottom panel. When they have bone metastasis, it's an indication of even more aggressive disease, and it's almost always in the presence of liver metastasis as well. Here's just another example of a patient with gastronoma and, and liver metastasis. The non-functional tumors are increasingly common, are more common than the patients with functional tumors. And, and as we uh, get more and more imaging for more and more things, kind of like thyroid cancer or prostate cancer, we, the more we look, the more we find, uh, pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors are kind of falling into that category now. In these patients, there is no syndrome to palliate by definition. Um, these are non-functional tumors. If they present because of symptoms, they're often quite large, and, and they can be difficult to treat from an oncologic perspective when uh, the tumor presents as a, a large uh, tail of the pancreas lesion, for example, based on gastric outlet syndromes or symptoms. Um, and the somewhat um, indolent nature of even these tumors uh, can justify fairly aggressive operations. Um, people can get a lot of length of, of uh, improved quality of life, if not cure, um, from aggressive operations mm -hmm. with uh, patients with locally invasive and or metastatic disease. This is an example of somebody with a very large uh, tumor in the body of the pancreas extending um, and, and pushing the, the stomach anteriorly. Um, these tumors it can require fairly um, aggressive operations and often uh, extensive preoperative planning. Uh, in order to, um, to remove them. The other end of the spectrum for these tumors are these small, incidentally identified uh, tumors. Uh, and this is uh, an example of a patient with a, a small tumor at the ampulla who presented with um, uh, jaundice, um, but was really a, a six or seven millimeter tumor that could be resected locally. Um, and so those tumors tend to be um, much easier to treat, uh, much easier to cure, um, and those are the tumors that we're now faced with and, and the question of whether we need to do anything at all. So I, I think I'll close here with talking a little bit about um, the incidental um, finding of pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. As I said, it's become more and more common and, and this 
recent report sort of highlights uh, some of those issues. Um, in this series, they, they compared, this is a series from uh, University of South Florida, um, 143 patients with non-metastatic uh, pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors who were who, uh, presented for operation, and most of them were operated on. Um, little less than half of them were incidentally discovered uh, tumors, and, and a few more of them presented as symptomatic tumors. Um, these were mostly non-functional tumors a after investigation. Most of them were stage one, most of them are low grade, um, and most of them were resected. 123 out of these 143 um, had, resectable, or had resected tumors. A few of them were not resected because they were either unresectable, um, they were borderline resectable and the patients opted not to have it, um, or five patients who had some other diseases and there was sort of risk benefit concerned about whether they should undergo these significant operations. Um, if you compare the patients who present incidentally with the patients who present with symptoms, uh, there's a fairly dramatic difference. And this is the progression-free survival curve with the incidental tumors in the blue line at the top and the symptomatic tumors in the yellow line that does a little worse. Uh, and so you can see there's about 85% of the patients um, at five years who've had no progression uh, if they presented with an incidental tumor. And if you look at overall survival, um, this reflects the, the good nature of these uh, tumors overall. Uh, even the symptomatic patients have an overall survival of 85% or so at five years. Uh, and the, the uh, incidental tumors are even better than that. And so this has kind of raised the question for a lot of us of when, when do we need to intervene for these small incidentally discovered pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors? I don't think we have an answer yet. I think the, the probably the best um, best available expert approach at this point is to say if the tumors are above a certain size and people choose a different size, maybe 15 millimeters, 20 millimeters, 25 millimeters, I think everybody above 25 millimeters would probably operate for an incidentally discovered uh, neuroendocrine tumor. Um, or if the tumor enlarges under observation, so if you have a smaller tumor, say um, 8 millimeters or 12 millimeters, you decide to watch for a while and at six months the tumor has grown by 50 percent, uh, then most people would intervene at that point. And I think uh, until we have better data about how to know which of these tumors are going to uh, grow and, and potentially cause problems, uh, we're kind of stuck with these two criteria of size on the one hand and progression on the other. So I think I will stop there and, and again thank Steve for the opportunity to, to kick off the symposium this year.